They called it the hunting ban. But four years after the Hunting Act came into force, hunting is as much a part of rural life as it ever was. The hunts insist that they are not breaking the law, at the same time as the government insists that the law is being enforced. When it comes to the Hunting Act, it seems, the devil is in the detail. A friend of mine told me last weekend he was going hunting. But as far as I remember, hunting was banned in 2004 by the Hunting Act. When I asked him about this, he told me he wasn't breaking the law. But he couldn't tell me why. I thought I'd find out for myself. The Hunting Act makes it illegal to hunt any wild mammal with dogs. But the next six pages outline the exceptions to the rule, and there are 62 of these. They are called exemptions. These exemptions mean that hunting isn't really banned. They also make it hard to tell what's allowed and what's not. My friend's hunt meets out in Wiltshire. I was invited to join them before one of their outings. This was the perfect opportunity to ask them how they understand the law. Or rather, if they understand the law. In terms of the exemptions in the hunting ban at the moment, what understanding do you have of them? Exemptions like what? Don't chase a fox? Well, not like don't chase a fox, but in... It's a badly thought out act. It's just ridiculous, the whole thing. So how much do you know about the exemptions of the hunting ban? I don't know much about the exemption of hunting bird, but I do. There have been several prosecutions, very few of which have been successful, I think. So the law, I think, is completely unworkable in practice. The exemption of the hunting ban, I, I know what um, we get informed really through the horse and hound, I think. They <laughs> keep us up to date, which yeah. uh, it does seem uh, a little bit grey in a lot of areas. Yeah, yeah. And um, I don't want to pretend I know very much about it. <laughs> Back to London, I needed to talk to someone who really knew their stuff, not only from a personal, but also from a legal point of view. This man was the executive director of the League Against Cruel Sports, but resigned on the basis that the Hunting Act did nothing for animal welfare. He is now part of the all-party parliamentary Middle Way Group, which is working to find an enforceable alternative to the Hunting Act. If you start from the wrong motives, mixed with people who don't really understand the issue, then you're going to get a flawed act of parliament. If you look at it, it's very badly defined, uh, and quite frankly, it's difficult for people to know sometimes whether they're breaking the law or not, and that, that's quite an indictment on any law. Everyone should know exactly where they stand. Speaking to Barrington made me want to go straight to the top and ask the minister responsible for the act what on earth it all meant. Cruel Sports campaigned for 80 years for a ban on hunting. They finally saw results here at Portcullis House in Westminster. In September 2002, three consecutive days were devoted to discussing a new parliamentary bill on hunting. The meetings were chaired here by Alan Michael, then Rural Affairs Minister, who was later to introduce the Hunting Act in 2004. I've returned to the scene of these meetings to ask Alan if the decisions made then have actually changed hunting in Britain now. Um, over half of the Hunting Act seems to, to put the emphasis on the exemptions and on the, the ways in which you can carry on hunting, and only a little bit seems to be on the actual ban itself. Do you think this means that the Act's more of a guideline on how to continue hunting? No, I think the Act's very clear indeed. Um, when the House of Commons decided that what they wanted was essentially a ban, uh, it was called a complete ban, but it's a ban with exemptions. Uh, how can a ban which he admits has exemptions be called complete? Uh, in general, uh, of course you don't want somebody to be found guilty of something that they didn't understand that they were doing. Uh, I put it to Alan that the reason the Hunting Act is called an act is because it doesn't outright ban hunting. He didn't seem to like that. I'm sorry, with respect, the ban on hunting is very clear. The exemptions are small, they're very specific. Uh, there are people who want to cause a good deal of muddle and try to say that it's confusing. They have been found to be wrong. In the style of a true politician, 
Michael wouldn't directly answer any of the questions I asked him. So I turned to an organisation that has been campaigning since 2004 to repeal the Hunting Act. The Countryside Alliance says the law fails at every level. It is badly drafted, illiberal, cruel and divisive. And to add to this, it says, public and political support for the Act has fallen dramatically. I went to meet the head of media at the Countryside Alliance. I wanted to ask him how the Alliance understands the law and why it wants it repealed. It comes to law and it's found to be completely unworkable, um, completely illogical and completely confusing. You're in a very difficult situation because either you're going to turn around and say we want something else which suggests that you've been doing something wrong for the last 50 years <laughs> or you're going to have to try and defend it. And, and I, you know, I, I feel very sorry for anyone who has to try and defend the Hunting Act because it is essentially indefensible. So much for the pros. Now I wanted to hear from the antis. The Hunting Act is uh, exceedingly uh, clear. It bans the hunting of uh, mammals uh, by dogs. So what you cannot do in this country is to chase a mammal with a pack of dogs. That's illegal. That's what's defined as hunting. But that's not what Barrington had said. In fact, that's the reason he left the League. Yes, I was ex executive director of the League for seven years. And during that time, certainly the latter time, I started to think that a simple ban on hunting with dogs would be the wrong thing from an animal welfare point of view. And in fact, there are three directors, three other directors, who also have taken that, that view too. If even the League was divided as to what this act stood for, surely there was no hope for your average huntsman. And looking at the list of prosecutions since 2004, it would seem that the courts, as well as the huntsman, are having trouble identifying the legal from the illegal. There is no more proof of this than Tony Wright's case. His guilt has been proven and disproven and stands to be reproven since he first came to court in 2002. These are the Royal Courts of Justice and after 19 months, Tony Wright's case has finally been brought here. Let me explain what happened. Back in 2006, Tony Wright was brought to trial by the League Against Cruel Sports. He was accused of breaching the Hunting Act whilst out with his hunt, the Exmoor Foxhounds. But Wright argued that he had been flushing a fox out to be killed by a marksman, a defence which is allowed in the Hunting Act. I might have been found guilty, but I certainly don't feel like a criminal. I'm still convinced he appealed against his conviction and got it overturned. But in doing so, he was forced to prove his own innocence rather than letting the prosecution prove his guilt. As a result, the judge who presided over his appeal said that the case raised fundamental questions about the burden of proof in court cases about hunting. I went back home to clear my head and to make some calls. Hi, I was hoping to speak to Lord Burns's PA, please. Yeah. Lord Burns headed the inquiry on hunting, upon which much of the Act was based. In his report, no conclusion was reached over whether hunting could be classed as cruel to foxes, and he warned that a ban on hunting might adversely affect the rural economy. Following the Burns inquiry, the Houses of Parliament saw seven years of stalemate over a proposed bill to ban hunting. Barrington had explained that, why. There was a power struggle between the Commons and the Lords. They wanted an issue which would divide the two, and this was the perfect vehicle for that because they knew that the Commons would go one way and the Lords would go another way. The government so, simply wanted the issue dealt with. Parliamentarians, those who voted for a ban on hunting, uh, had a mixture of motives. The government were paying back a debt. The people that were against hunting, or supposedly against hunting, um, helped the government get in power. Tony Blair paid, is paid the, the debt by having hunting banned. He, he knew it would be a ridiculous law, but he paid his debt and that's all they're interested in. They, quite frankly, could not care less about animal welfare. Uh, I've had it said to my face that this is nothing to do with animal welfare. This is for the miners. Um, that this is a political battle. And that's what it became. It became like a grudge match. Country. But when you look at the history of the Blair years, there's no doubt that um, when he was at his weakest, um, when, when he was taking the country to war over Iraq and when he was doing things which were very unpopular with his backbenchers, that was the time he chose to allow them to have their hunting act. So 
So was the Hunting Act doomed from the start? If a law should be based on a firm principle, then in this case, it was meant to be animal welfare. But in the absence of this driving principle, a law was written and passed that, for many, cannot ever work. Since 2004, there have been 21 convictions over fox hunting. The government uses this figure to show how effectively the law is punishing those who continue to hunt illegally. But those on horseback know that this is only a fraction of hunts which continue, as before, uncaught. The law is hard to understand, and even harder to enforce. It is the product of a Labour government which, when it came to animal welfare, many think preferred to sit on the fence than take decisive action. <laughs>